Venus type, as the organisers suggest, then um, this paper, right at the end of the session, is that track when you used to kind of compile cassettes back in the day, you'd always have a bit of space at the end, you put something a bit odd on there, or something that kind of fit the space that's available. So um, that's, I think, is this, is, this, um, is this offering. I'm just going to start the clock. Um, I'm not used to reading from for scripts, so I wasn't quite sure. I've not practiced very in a very tight style. So I'm hoping to come in, in hopefully within time. Um, I'll put the clock on myself. So, um, so yes, what, um, what are we talking about? So um, we're going to take a kind of playful uh, look at uh, what we're going to refer to as the musical archive. Um, and as you'll see, we're going to link that very loosely to archiving in general in archaeology. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna um, begin with uh, that kind of uh, that idea, um, and then we'll introduce what we, what we refer to as the Vismond Modiano paradox, which is to do with different forms of memorialisation and memory. Um, and we're going to reflect a little bit on the musical archive, and then we're going to finish off with uh, what we're going to refer to as the auto archive, and we're going I'm going to look very briefly at um, Morrissey's autobiography. I'm going to assume everyone knows who Morrissey is. Okay, if you don't, I can't help you. So, um, <laughs> so there we go. Okay. Okay. What is sovereign, in fact, is to enjoy the present time without having anything else in view but this present time. With this statement, George Bataille uh, captures the central problem of the musical archive. Our concept of the MA raises specific issues and themes which could be traced back to ways of thinking about the paradox that underlies all forms of memorialisation, or, in the Thai's language, a problem linked to the intensity of moments in present time. The paradox can be simply stated as follows. That which is always missing from the musical archive, and the archaeological archive for that matter, is ultimately that which defines the value and importance of both. This problem is acute to the musical archive, which ultimately seeks to memorialise intense moments that are only vaguely indicated by, for example, a guitar in a glass case. This intensity of the present moment is not necessarily a moment of presence, but an event, a musical happening. An archaeological archive is arguably most valuable as an assemblage through which we recover events and happenings as forms linked to past human lives in mute material fragments. Just as the archaeologist is drawn to questions about human experiences in past time, one might have similar imaginings visiting the site of the Hacienda Club in Manchester. That's what it is now, it's been turned into flats. Or the Band on the Wall, for that matter, as you just heard. For those who ever felt part of the musical scene, it is the moments of intensity that ultimately compose or underlie our personal archive. Emerson de describes Bataille's concept thus, sovereignty, or sovereignty lies in its immediacy where the process of thought and calculation is suspended. So I think for anyone who's ever experienced a night out listening to intense music, that kind of summarises that kind of feeling quite well. The irony, of course, is these moments are forever gone. So the ghost of past creation and creativity haunts the archive to the extent that it easily ends up with fetishised places, as well as objects, separated from the energies that make them worth celebrating in the first place. This problematic we refer to as the Bismuth Modiano, Modiano paradox, as it is based on ideas drawn from these scholars of memorialisation. Bismuth, the late Cornelia Bismuth, who died tragically young actually, was a scholar of files in particular and archives in general. She writes that archival records reveal the totality of the present past and traces the words to the Greek archaeon, public mementos. But Bismuth also writes wistfully of the retrieval of life deposited in files. For all the celebration of the remembering archive, there is something that is always left out, those forms of life that cannot be deposited. <coughs> Positive, sorry. The archive is surrounded by the totality of life that eludes it. Patrick Modiano's novels concern a similar problematic. For instance, all that remains of passing circus in a novel of the same name is a faded photograph on the wall of a dusty bar. The various notebooks kept by characters in novels like The Black Notebook and in the cafes of our lost youth all ultimately failed to capture the details of the lives they set out to record, the 
to come in and sell a catalogue to Tracy, empty cafes, memories of lives passing through. As the narrator comments in Night Watch, surveying the piles of suitcases that constitute the archive of those who fled the mansion that Theo gets occupied, he might start enumerating the contents, old toys, programmes and events, the family mementos, but what would be the point? Hence, our central premise is to suggest the musical archive should be cast as a fundamental provocation rather than a nostalgic reminiscence associated with things or places. Its energies are perhaps most properly an invitation to further creation, to an intensification, a good repetition, rather than fetishization or reification, a bad repetition, which requires the immobilization of whatever led to the MO being constituted in the first place. The gap between good and bad repeti repetition can be as narrow as the groove on a record. These themes have, at least to some extent, appeared in archaeological writing and in compressed form. What we mean by intensification or good repetition is what Schofield might mean by punk archaeology, particularly the DIY, DIY cut of punk. It's democratisation of creativity. You could say, here are three chords, now form a band. Here's your shovel, start digging. Given Schofield's apparent dislike of excavation, the shovel is, of course, a metaphor. Only an idiot would call a spade a spade. The fundamental problem of the MA is a matter of its constitution. One could call this the hard rock cafe moment, as the HRC figures the problem in, in its most acute form, the commodification of musical memorabilia. That struck me when I was performing in the session yesterday on Art and Art and Archaeology, um, in her poem said, a good museum challenges the mind, the bad one the will to live, which struck me. <laughs> similar to this, what we're suggesting here. In a less intense but no doubt related form is fandom, which can take the form of individual collections of memorabilia, or a more formal and organised manifestation that would also include aspects of the heritage inventory. So, the MA can be compiled well or badly. There is a zone of indistinction between these moments. Is a, a dim from David Bowie's bag worth archiving, for example? At another level, which perhaps becomes more interesting, the problem of the MA is that of memories affected onto objects or places, or even existing in some kind of free-floating form. These memories are related to the enjoyment of music, or to experiences and who associated with the enjoyment of music. This is one reason why record collection is so evocative. The various valences of the MA gesture is something that is both present and absent in all its representation, proxies and holders, organised or not. This is hard to describe, as it is perhaps always elsewhere in take metaphorical form. In a very real sense, it cannot be owned, but it can be experienced. One way of gesturing at it, as we suggested earlier on, is perhaps through notions of energy, fullness, or the kind of sovereign power that the tide describes. It might also be what Schofield calls the moment of punk, when one takes hold of one's takes hold of the power of one's own definition and becomes one's own project. An energy then of self definition. The methodological problem is how to articulate this energy exactly as its form is one of fluidity, of a kind of urging to form that nevertheless, nevertheless does not want to be limited by form. The way in which a powerful band or performer provokes imitators, but the true contender will go beyond the master. Our conception takes seriously the tendency of powerful music to invite reading of itself. Explain the listener's fashion, fascination, or at least the desire to return, to listen again, to write about and think about, where ultimately fascination is, is with creative power finding form. It is very difficult to describe what we mean because it is precisely the feeling of power or energy that, in a peculiar way, is entirely disembodied, although in striking a particular listener at a particular time, it is fixed in a particular way. In some ways, this experience is cross-cutting. It does not matter what genre of music. It doesn't matter if it is a hit or a single out of a charity shop box. Something happens. The primal commodification of music in the recording thus enables, or rather might enable, there is no guarantee, you can buy lots of records, see a lot of bands, and still not quite get it, the summoning of an energy that then can slacken, and through the weak force of nostalgia, kind of gravity, enter the tame orbit of more massive bodies in the industry of archivization and memorialization. 
If there is work in the happening, the value of it might, might be in some way in which the song invites and provokes its listener in a way that entirely subjective effects are triggered by music's articulate energy. Ultimately, though, we have to set and settle for second best, for a kind of hermeneutics of musical energy that an, uh, as an entirely second order discourse is analytical, analytical language that can best approximate how energy takes form and creates a world. The foundational problem of the archive appears in a related form in the autobiography, which is the cause and archive of the self. It is not just a banal question of what to include or exclude, rather the issue is much more acute. How to invoke the shape of the life. The content, sorry, how to invoke the shape of the life. The content of the archive autobiography is something of a contradiction as it must always gesture towards something that cannot be included. The archive autobiography is at its most banal and uninteresting when it attempts to capture the uniqueness of the character. It is at its most active when, in the act of writing, the character effaces itself or becomes no more than a focal point for other impersonal energies to communicate themselves. We can use this sense of the archive autobiography as a communicator of impersonal energy to determine what Morrissey's autobiography can tell us about a memorialization of place person and music. I'm going to hop on a bit now to perhaps completely um, misjudge this. The book begins, my childhood is streets upon streets upon streets upon streets. The street is the place of passage, the interchange of energies, and the first pages are focused upon tracing various thresholds and zones that exist in the mapping of Manchester, Dublin and elsewhere onto the imagination. This first is a, sorry, this is first of all a summoning of many absences and lines of migration. That of the maternal and paternal family from Dublin to Manchester, a pattern of immigration is in person to personal. The good looking Irish crawling the slums of Moss Eyes and Hughes. The story is also one of chance connections that create family. Okay, so few short lines that exist for the trace, and this is kind of bookending the session where we began with Proust and we're going to finish with a bit of Proust. Of Alaric Hirsch 
Archives Alba see the objects of his affections. Morrissey is aware that he is acting as the curator of himself. He is his own Albertine. The archiving of Albertine is a pri privilege reserved to the writer whose text, as a mode of memorialization, fixes the objects as something to be memorialized. Thus, the reason for reading this passage is to comment on Morrissey's own archiving, archiving the creative power that interpolated him. While he seems to be at the height of his creativity, he is the one compelled by something he has caught, which, which will escape him. Morrissey is well aware that what inspired the archive escapes from it at the very moment the archive is constituted. Thank you.